Welcome to the C Word, the Conservatives podcast. Today we're talking about building a business. I'm Jenna Mathiason, an objects conservator based in Carmarthenshire. And I'm Chloe Rumsey, an objects conservator based in Manchester. Welcome to the show, everyone. Welcome. Hello. Which episode is this? Which number is this? Mid-season 11 now. Mid-season. So Mid-season 11. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today we're going to talk about uh, building a business and also running a business, running our own show. To help us talk about that, we have two special guest hosts with us today. Uh, would you like to introduce yourselves to our listeners? Hello, everyone. I am Lorraine Finch. I'm an accredited conservator and sustainability advisor. And over to Claire. Hi, I'm Claire Fry. I'm a venture conservator. Thank you so much for joining us today, guys. You are very much the voices of experience in this, because <laughs> I, I am a baby business owner, which is a very different ride. <laughs> and I'm not a business owner at all. So No, that's true. <laughs> We've got a spectrum going on here. But Jenny, how, how long have you been running your business? So technically, I started it late in 2020, but uh, it's didn't properly take off, I would say, until the start of this year when I actually got premises because before then I, you know, it existed on paper, but it, it was sort of an entity that was floating around in my head and on paper. And uh, I really felt like it wasn't real until I had somewhere to actually do conservation, which sounds really weird, but it's one of the things that I'm hoping that we can talk about. All of my insecurities, basically, this is a Jenny insecurity episode. <laughs> This isn't an episode, this is therapy. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really hoping that this might help other people who uh, listen to the mm. show and might be either thinking of running a business or who are already running businesses. I think it will just be helpful to talk about these things because actually we're not that great at talking business in conservation. We mostly talk about what it's like working in institutions, which is, of course, lovely and nice and loads of us do, but also loads of us don't. And actually, I don't have any numbers for like how many people... Say in Icon, for example, we, how many conservatives might be in private practice versus in institutions? I don't actually have figures for that, and I don't know if anyone does. So a rough count of Institute of Conservation members is a 50-50 split between those who are employed and those who are running their own business. See, that's way higher than I thought it would be. Yeah, yeah, same. That means that there's an awful lot of us who do this now, and that's sort of badass that we don't brag about it enough. It must be a scary thing as well, really scary thing as well to become business owners. I'm so interested in why you're saying it's scary. Tell me, tell me, what are you thinking? I suppose maybe this says more about me. <laughs> Stepping out on your own, it must feel sort of exposing and suddenly, you know, it's potentially you might feel that you no longer have colleagues, you have competitors almost. And that maybe that's why we don't talk about it so much, because there's this idea of like not being so frank about our rates and stuff. Maybe we don't want to talk about it so openly because we think, oh, I don't want, I don't know whether I can, I don't know if it's appropriate, I don't know if it's whether I can talk to this person, are they going to think I'm trying to pinch their business? I don't know, this is this is just... Those are all good thoughts. I suppose I'm coming from the world of belly dancing, oh. <laughs> that there's quite a lot of undercutting and mm. um, sort of politics going on it just in the world of professional dancing in restaurants like that and that's it's an extremely small world but it's there is a lot of this sort of oh we lost this venue this week because so and so is undercut and gone rogue or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and i'm not saying at all that conservatives would do that i have to say on the whole i found the conservatives quite supportive um i think only yeah only okay one, only one conservator who said because there was talk about setting up a business group and one person said i don't really want to be part of that because i don't want to give away any commercial information but on the whole, it's I think it's quite supportive. And I think a lot of freelancers have networks with other freelancers or companies have networks with other companies because quite a lot of projects you can't do by yourself. So it's a real benefit to say, do you know, yeah. I can't help you with that, but I know someone who can and I can recommend them or for a big project, we might subcontract mm -hmm. people. So on the whole, I found it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, quite a supportive world to be in. I would agree. And this is something fun because locally, I've tried to um, be part of sort of various sort of business groups and things just to network with other people who also run small businesses in my area not in my field at all just you know it's it's nice to be part of something and meet other people because ultimately yeah I 
don't have built-in colleagues anymore. So it's just nice to sort of get to know people. And I moved to a new area for me. So that means that I still need to put down roots and get make connections and that sort of thing. And so I, I joined various sort of networking things at a local business hub. They're mostly over Zoom, but sometimes they're in person and they're all really nice people. And at some point I did mention that because it sort of came up like, who are your competitors and stuff like that? And I was like, well, there are other conservatives about, but they're useful people to know because that way, if they can't take on a job, then they might pass on someone's details to me. Or uh, it might be that we have different specialisms. Like I don't do paintings or books famously, but if I know people who do paintings and books, then obviously I can refer like people who need that sort of work to them. And people seemed really surprised. They were like, what? Do people actually refer work to other people? And I was like, yes, that of course that's how it works. And they seemed really perplexed by this. Like that isn't something that goes on in other lines of business, maybe as much. But I feel like conservatives are quite good at sharing. I mean, it's because mm. like you say, Claire, sometimes you can't do it on your own or you can't do it at all. We all have our different strengths and weaknesses, I guess. And sometimes it's just that you're busy or you're off on another job or you don't have enough space to do a thing like that. Or yeah, I mean, it depends on what you do, but it's yeah, I think it is quite cherry, actually. I, I don't I'm not a business owner, but I do work in a studio in a museum that does outside contract work for income generating the museum. You do work commercially. Yeah, and we do tend to get, you know, a lot of emails and send a lot of emails of uh, along the lines of we don't have capacity for that, but this mm -hmm. person might or I've got this person who is interested in doing this if you have capacity or if you know any other contacts. So it's it is my experience with the studio is much different from my experience with the dancing. <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to look at belly dancers the same way again now. <laughs> Such a cutthroat business. It, it's different in different places. I think I think London can be a bit, you know, hard. But I have an agent, so it, this always all goes over my head and it's, you know, keeps it in one direction at least. I think that's a good point that Jenny brought up, that there's loads of networks and free support. So the local business enterprise I went to when I started my business was super helpful, gave me loads of advice. I got loads of one-to-one -one mentoring, loads of training sessions and the networks. And although they weren't conservators, it was really still interesting to talk to people who were setting up businesses as well and hear sort of what they were doing and learn from their experience. So um, there is lots of um, business development growth hubs and all sorts of things out there that can be really, really helpful to talk to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've said in the past before, I never pay for any of my business development or support. It's all been through what's been available locally. So nationally, you've got the BIPC, which is the Business and Information Property Centre. Sorry, so Business and Intellectual Property Centre. Then you've got Mentor, which is Norfolk and Suffolk. You've got um, lots of local enterprise partnerships. You've got bid networks. There's so much, so much support out there for people setting up businesses. And the banks now are offering a lot of support for people setting up businesses. So first time around. So um, NatWest are supporting women in business, for example. So yeah, there is so much support out there and available to, to everyone. I've actually gone to loads of free training uh, again because it's available. It's, it's fully funded. Uh, so I don't need to pay anything. And it's just good knowledge to have. Uh, it's applicable to whatever you do. I mean, yeah, some of their examples won't be particularly applicable to what you're doing, maybe, but you can, as always, transfer those uh, bits, uh, bits and pieces of advice and uh, knowledge and use them in your own working life. So I think that's actually really a really, really good idea. It's not all about taxes. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, there is some taxes. <laughs> a fair bit of it is, yeah. but not all of it. <laughs> Yeah, and that's a really important point as well, Jenny. It's not just about how to set up a business and how to run a business. It's also the information about how to use social media for publicity, um, you know, how to use e even as simple as if you've never set up an Instagram account, how to use Instagram. So this, the support runs across a whole gamut of the skills that you need to, to run a business. It isn't simply about setting up your business. Off you go, there you are, and there's no support now. Well, I'm quite keen to go through, I don't know if maybe this is a, a nice way of looking into the topic. I, I'm really interested to know from the group of the three of you, what made you start? What made you think, I want to go freelance? I feel like we, we talked to about this a little bit with the freelancing episode. So if you're interested in that, do check that out. I have no idea which season that was in now. We'll link to it in show notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. What made you think, 
actually, this is what I want to do. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll start as the baby. It's that we were moving to a new area and I do, am not willing to give up my career. Uh-huh. This is it. I love this stuff. So this, this is my way of continuing is to do this for myself. And uh, it was something I'd always mm-hmm. sort of thought about anyway. And I think in some ways it's probably helpful that I mm. had a parent who did have their own business for a bit growing up. So I've, I've seen it happen. Yeah. And then the, the, this may or may not be something that listeners already know, but uh, for a while I was the only income earner because my other half was running a company. Basically, I have seen it up close a lot. So I was sort of happy to do it for myself, if that makes sense, as a way of continuing my career, because I love this stuff. And also, I suppose, as a, as a side uh, for this is that it's also taught me what success can look like, because we always think of business success as like making bank and like just being super successful, being the best, being the first, being the the biggest, making the most money. And actually a lot of stuff in business is about keeping ticking over, like meeting your costs, staying alive, keep doing what you're doing. It's not necessarily about exponential growth or selling selling your company to someone one day or something like that. That's not actually what business success looks like. It can be, but that's in a, you know... Yeah, I guess it has helped with my perspective that, you know, meeting your cross, plugging away, doing your thing, that is also success. That is you doing your thing. That's that's a viable business. That's good. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So for me, it was, I want to keep doing what I'm doing and I'm somewhere new and I'm going to do it for myself. That's where it is. Mm, I find that really interesting, Jenny, because there's a lot of parallels between your story and mine. So I had always wanted to set up my own business. I always intended to become self-employed. So when I finished my first degree and before going to Camberwell to train as a conservator, I looked at the different opportunities there were available in terms of a choice of, of a second degree to then set up in that profession as a freelancer. But I, like you, had a parent who ran his own business. My dad was a taxi driver. He set up a taxi firm in the 1960s. And I also come from a seaside town where a lot of the mums and dads ran their own businesses, they ran hotels, they ran restaurants. So I had that model around me through my entire life. And it was something that I wanted to do. So chose conservation, because I knew that eventually, I could set up as a freelancer in conservation. The thing that prompted me to do it when I did it was my well being, because I got fed up with being badly managed. So for the sake of my own mental health, and my well being, that was the time to jump ship and to set up my own business. And I've never looked back. I absolutely love it. And I really, where you're talking about a viable business and security, in terms of the viability, you know, what of a viable business is not necessarily about making lots of money. It's about what makes you happy. And if you can do that on your terms, brilliant. So that's why I became self-employed. I had a lifelong, that's always what I wanted to do. I had lots of models in my life to do it. And it was for my, for my well-being. And I love it. And I'd never do anything else. My story is, quite a bit different actually so I didn't move I had a job like my job worked for the charity fantastic properties really nice team I think in hindsight I was coming up to 40 and I had a bit of a midlife crisis and <laughs> I thought well, I'm going to change something up and um, and I could kind of see that there was this business out there I mean there's lots of really fantastic preventive conservators Hallahan Associates and um, Fiona Callister and others so you know I wasn't the first but I could sort of see that maybe there was this idea of a business and I was thinking about it a lot and it got to a point my husband said, either start this business or please stop talking about it. <laughs> and I thought, right. <laughs> yeah. That's the sort of support from a loved one you need, isn't it? Sharp or do it. <laughs> um, and I thought, yeah, right. I'm going to show you. And I don't know anyone who runs a business. So I thought, well, let's give this a go then. So I did. So I quit my job and, um, and set up the company. Amazing. Well done. What was his reaction when you quit um, your job? This, this is the need to go in the episode. I'm just really I think, interested. I think he was uh, thinking, great, she'll stop talking about it now, but I haven't stopped talking about it yeah. since. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I mean, he has been really supportive because it was a commitment for him that, you know, if this doesn't go well, then it's all on you to uh, to bring to pay the mortgage. So, yeah, I wouldn't have done it without his without his backing. Oh, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot to be said for a good supportive uh, structure around you when you do these things, for sure. I mean, it definitely would not be possible for me if it wasn't for my other half actually earning money now. 
for most of our relationship, it's been the other way around uh, because he was running a business, uh, being self-employed and just ticking that along, which is great. And it, you know, it was something that made him happy. But also there's been a complete role reversal where we're now doing it the complete other way around where he earns money and I basically don't because I pour all of my resource, resources into running this now. Uh, and, and that's that's where it's at. And it will be for quite some time. And it's it's strange, but I am enjoying it. Can I, can I interrupt, though, for those pe- for those people who are listening and thinking I don't have that support structure around me, you can do it on your own because I do. You definitely can. You can, yeah. Well, that's what I'm about to say. Jenny, you didn't know whether you had that support, but you still gunned for it and you asked for help and you planned and you looked at how it could come about without the support. That's true. There were some very dicey times for us as a household Mm. because we were definitely between jobs and in precarious Mm. situations for a while there. I mean, there's been a pandemic, guys. It's been quite hard (laughs) on people in general. Um, so that's, it's definitely been a ride. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that I did to be able to secure premises was that I crowdfunded it. I, I asked people for help to be able to get the deposit and first month's rent together because I I was desperate to start this and I knew that I couldn't do it any other way. So I asked for help. I've had some mixed reactions to that, which has been beautiful. Uh, but yeah, you're right. This would have happened sort of with or without support, but it's certainly more helpful to have the support. Uh, but I also recognise that that's an immensely privileged uh, situation that I definitely wasn't banking on. I'm very grateful for, but I also know that it will not be the case for everyone. And you can also totally do it on your own. Like, it's not like you have to be a kept woman. <laughs> yes. That's totally not what we're doing here. Uh, and it's something that I've brought up plenty in the past. And I do not like that as a sector, we do tend to lean a little bit too heavily on being kept women, um, usually. <laughs> And I and I agree as well. I didn't want to make it sound like leaning on my husband, but it's just, you know, the fact we've got kids and we do a lot of filming supervision, mm. which is 15 hour days. So our lifestyle, everything would have had Ooh. to have changed. And, you know, I, he, yeah, it's a lot easier to yeah have him on board. Yeah, absolutely. And also we should say that just because you're not maybe not in a traditional relationship, for example, or something doesn't mean that you don't have support structures uh, around you. You know, it's just that your support structures will look different. Uh, it might not be financial, it might be emotional, it might be that you have supportive family members, friends, colleagues. Support structures look different for everyone. So how did you do it, Lorraine? So um, the best bit of advice that I was given before I set up my business was have a buffer in the bank. So work out how much you need uh, and keep, mm. if you, if possible, and again, it's not possible for everybody to have three months buffer in the bank. So when I set up the business, I had three months buffer in the bank. I had a choice of buying a small property or a large property. I decided I was going to buy a large property and my large property would keep me. So I rented rooms out. And so I knew I had an income mm. and I found little bits of part-time jobs like exam invigilation. So I knew I had an income. So I knew I could get through those first one or two years. So you wow. had a little bit of lead up to the decision then. It wasn't like a clean break. I've had enough. It was, so this is the end of my contract date and I will continue until that date. That's a really interesting kind of mental preparation for that. I mean, very few people probably wake up and go, you know, what? I'm just going to quit my job today. And I'm, <laughs> <True. laughs> I'm going to go solo. True. It's probably quite rare. There will be some level probably of uh, thinking, you know what, maybe this is something you want to look into or this is there's some level of planning here. <laughs> people rarely flip the bench and walk out. <laughs> There'll be a lot. <laughs> also, our workbenches are really heavy. It's really hard to flip. <laughs> And another thing that's probably worth mentioning, uh, you know, for anyone who's thinking about this, is that there's not one way of running a business. Mm. It is entirely up to you how you do this. You uh, will have some legal obligations. But uh, other than that, you you make the rules. If you don't want to work nine to five, you don't work nine to five. I usually work 11 to seven. I like that. That's why you always have dinner so late. You know, you do everything the way that you want it to be done um and a lot of that can be experimenting and finding out that actually oh no i I don't like the way i do that at all i'll I'll have to change that or i don't understand why anyone does it this way i want to do it this way Uh, and those are all fine things to learn that's all part of running your own business is trying to figure out those things absolutely and jenny i don't know and lorraine if you felt if you found this but i've certainly noticed that i have to 
go with my gut instinct a lot more mm -hmm. running a business because you haven't got teams and other people and departments to talk to and say this is how you do it you decide how to do it but actually sometimes you think oh I don't know how to do this I'm just going to have to go with what I think is the best thing to do I think it's true that you have to trust yourself in in a way that you know maybe maybe if you're part of a bigger team then you sort of have to trust the team or there's someone else to look to can make the decision as we're hey, it's, it's you making the decision so you've got to trust yourself you know yourself best so I was thinking that when when Jenny was talking earlier about you do have to make every decision that, that's not necessarily a good thing that's not necessarily a bad thing but you have to make every decision so from shall mm. I stop now and have a cup of tea to what treatment do I apply to this should I do my tax return today? You know, how to, or whatever. You have to make every decision from the very small ones to the very big ones. That is true. Although I have to say there's also an enormous freedom with that because an actual example was when I finished a job for someone and I said, okay, so I'm going to send this back to you. Are you happy with that? Okay, here's an invoice. Uh, she got back to me and said, okay, do you take PayPal? And I take PayPal for everything in my life, but I hadn't set it up for the business yet because it hadn't occurred to me someone would want to PayPal me, even though, of course, why not? It's a perfectly legit way of receiving money. So I went and set it up and I didn't have to ask mm. anyone permission. <laughs> I didn't have to have a meeting. I didn't have to take it to the finance department to go, you know what? We should take PayPal as well as card and over the phone and all of that. I didn't have to do that. I could just go, give me 20 minutes. And there it was. I had PayPal. <laughs> that is a really great aspect that you have that, you know, you have that ability to do things. There isn't a chain that you necessarily have to go through. So if you want to go and set PayPal up, yeah. like you say, 20 minutes later, it's done. We've talked in the podcast before that there is definitely a, a support structure difference when you have colleagues versus when you don't have colleagues. And I definitely noticed that when I was working on outside contracts in the museum on my own when my colleague was on maternity leave, that it was like different. And oh, this isn't value judgment either. I think it's we all make decisions. We all work very hard, but it is just different. It is. So sometimes it's useful not to have all these departments mm. that you have to run things by. And then sometimes, like I remember the first time recruiting somebody, I was thinking, <laughs> how on earth do I do this? So I have an HR advisor and my accountant helps me out a lot because suddenly that finance, that HR team actually, <laughs> oh yeah, they're not here now. <laughs> I don't have that. So it would be quite useful to get some advice on this. What are the real big things? Like I'm, I've, on my you know list of things as a person who's never had to consider this before insurance the legal stuff we've mentioned taxes i think it'd be really good to go into that it feels like a massive web of complication to me and how how did we all deal with it i have a list called things i found hard <laughs> so far <laughs> that is perfect <laughs> the top of that list is insurance mm. because even though we're all in it together, people are very rarely happy to talk about their insurance. Mm. They are surprisingly cagey about it. I, I did say that we are great sharers, but sometimes it's very difficult to get people to talk about insurance, presumably because people feel maybe insecure mm. about it or like that that's none of your business. Or, uh, I mean, it's fine. You don't have to tell me. I felt very alone looking into insurance. I did ask other people what sort of insurance they had. Sometimes they'd get back to me, sometimes they wouldn't. We were asked for it all the time. Just sent off my insurance certificate twice this morning. Oh, wow. So, yeah, no, <laughs> insurance is a big thing. Initially, I was talking to people to get quotes and it just, they didn't really get conservators. Mm. And then preventive conservation, they were like, what, so you don't actually touch anything or do anything? <laughs> so we may touch something, <laughs> we might not touch something. So... I think once you know the people to talk to, it's a lot easier. So, yeah, if anyone wants to talk to me about insurance, I'm more than happy for them to contact me. I'll talk about insurance. Yay! <laughs> Excellent. I felt tremendously alone in trying to look at insurance, mostly because, again, even when people could tell me who they were with, for example, uh, trying to talk to people and get a quote was really hard because often people don't understand what we do, even when I try to explain it in about five different ways. And often I would get the reply, we we don't cover any of that. And I'm like, you do? I, I have literally talked to several people who are insured by you. You do cover that. But it's just about talking to the right person at the company as well. Mm. And if you can't get that right person, yeah, you're sort of out of luck. 
which is really hard work and really disheartening. What I ended up doing was actually going through an insurance broker who already deals with conservators and people in museum fields and particularly freelancers. And it did make it a much less painful process. <laughs> and it meant, meant that they actually understood what I was talking about. They could convey it to other people. And I could ultimately get quotes that I was happy with. And that's really the main thing. So for me, the solution was talk to a broker. I went through someone who could really talk me through the different bits that I would need, because there are a lot of different bits to insurance. There are mm. many bits that you need. <laughs> and you actually sometimes have to end up buying bits that you don't yeah. need, but it's part of the deal. So I have products liability, and I don't <laughs> have any products. But yeah. yeah. In answer to your question, Chloe, I would give a, a broader answer. It's about cash flow. Cash flow is the killer of businesses. So, you know, you can do a piece of work, you can submit your invoice, and then it's not paid for three months, five months. It could be longer mm. than that. And it's not that your business isn't viable. It's not that you're not working. It's because people aren't paying their invoices. And it's been particularly bad over the pandemic. And I work more with institutions than I do with individuals. And the argument has oh, has been over the pandemic. Oh, well, you know, our finance department, everybody's working from home and it's really slow. Uh, and it's been taking up to five months to get invoices paid. And where I go, wow. I go back to that buffer. If you don't have that buffer, then you've got nothing to get you through those periods mm. where you're waiting for invoices to be paid and you know you're going to be paid, but it's just waiting for that money. And the thing with invoices as well is, this is probably pre-pandemic, is sometimes they contain things that you've already paid for. So, for example, hotels and transport and mm. travel and lots you know, mm. materials yeah. that you might have purchased. So cash flow, buffer. If you take nothing else away from this or what I've said is have a buffer it's a good point. So it, if you've had a successful job and you've been paid on time, put that aside because you might you might need that as your little cushion uh, when next time you're waiting for someone to pay their invoice, for example. I was going to say for the younger ones who might not be thinking about this, pensions, getting a pension. Oh, don't even. No, stop that now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about pensions. And you need to think about it. I, I don't even know how to approach this yet, but uh, yet is very much the thing. So I have bits of pension from like, you know, having been employed in the past. I have not yet worked out how on earth I'm going to have anything to save and put into a pension now that I am self-employed. Uh, this is very much a sort of a aspirational thing. <laughs> Where like, oh, imagine earning enough to be able to put something aside <laughs> one day. <laughs> Love it. But please, as a more experienced person, please talk about pensions. <laughs> It's finding the pension provider as well, somebody that will actually provide a pension for somebody who's self-employed. Claire, do you have you managed mm. to? Um, I suppose it's slightly different because we're a limited company, so we're signed up with Nest. So we do have a pension scheme. It's funny when you go to all these business network things and people are talking about, you know, I'll get to 40 and sell my company and be a millionaire. And I'm thinking, <laughs> that's not quite what I think my reality is going to be. I feel like this really beautifully illustrates your point, Lorraine. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And it's so important because, you know, the, the being able to save into a pension, the longer you do it, the better it is. You know, obviously, you're going to have more money at the, the end of your career to have a happy, comfortable retirement. I, like Jenny, wasn't able to have money to put into a pension for quite a few years. But the bigger, bigger issue was finding a pension provider that would actually support somebody who was self-employed. Same if you've got mortgages, you know, it's very difficult to get a mortgage sometimes when you're self-employed. But I'm with uh, Aviva and Aviva offers a pension for the self-employed. And there are a lot more providers now than there were when I started. Mm. And I've also got my pension in what I would call a green fund. So it's not in things that are in oil extraction and, you know, arms and uh, aviation companies. It's actually in sustainable funds. While we were talking about cash flow, that got me thinking about taxes and I don't know how much you want to talk about taxes because it's one of those famously ridiculously dry topics but I've got experience with doing a self assess you know online self-assessment I've always felt every single year like I'm sort of sidling along and not really understanding and just hoping that I'm not doing anything illegal like I'm sort of going I think this is right I don't understand. I've read all the explanations. I think I'm right. I think I've not accidentally created a you know, massive illegal uh, fraud something something. Am I right? I think a lot of people feel like, like that. So don't, don't feel like I'm you're glad. a bad grown up. I think a lot of people feel like that. <laughs> 
Yeah, I've forgotten to declare some gift aid. Am I going to get arrested? Yeah, exactly. And I've never, I never have any of the, do you have, uh, you know, offshore, whatever? Do you have, have you received any of this? Have you got, you know, benefits from here and there and whatever? It's just literally been small amounts of income and small amounts of outgoing that I've gone. Did I calculate it? Did I forget about a thing? I don't know. Have I entered this correctly? I would say that if anyone's thinking of setting up a limited company, you have to get your accounts done, your company accounts. So I've got an amazing accountant. And I think at the beginning, I used to email her all the time with, is this a stupid question? Or um, I'm really sorry if I've missed something. But yeah, and she's and she's great. So I too put my trust in an, in, in an accountant, too, like basically going, I don't know what any of this means or what I'm doing in terms of the accountancy bit. Help. I'm really glad that I have listened to people who said, you know, just just get an accountant, get an accountant, do it, get an accountant. And I'm very glad that I have followed that piece of advice, because otherwise I would be constantly <laughs> bricking it about not doing something correctly. So in some ways, I don't worry about it. I will be told what I owe by my accountant and it'll be fine. I work it out from there. <laughs> like you, Chloe, I do my own. Ah, It's much easier than it used to be. The online system now is much more um, user friendly than it ever used to be and it's got better you know give the hmrc their due they have listened to the feedback and have simplified the system Mm. it's still i mean it's you know you do still sit there and think okay is that the question that that they want the answer to what is the question have i answered that question correctly but i frequently get emails from them with um, links to videos and training sessions that i can attend to help me should i have questions around you know it's it's a good idea to to get an accountant, but it's also possible if your um, affairs aren't that complicated to do it yourself. Absolutely. Because I'm a sole trader, not a limited company, my affairs are are much simpler. Again, so this was the same time when I was talking about becoming self-employed and the same time I was given the advice about having a buffer. I was talking to somebody who I was on a course at the time and he said to me, and I said, look, I'm really worried about becoming self-employed because I'm terrified of the tax. And he said to me, it's really simple. He said, you have two piles. You have one pile for the money in and one pile for the money out. He said, you know, you're an intelligent adult. You can do this. And we're all intelligent adults, you know, so don't underplay your abilities and what you can and can't do. But if you my point is, if you keep things in order and don't stick everything in a plastic bag like my dad used to do and leave it. To the <laughs> and like my dad still does. <laughs> then like I do. Be. I didn't say that. <laughs> straightforward (laughs) (laughs) but there's loads of software and apps now that really help so accountancy software i use zero i love it we used um dex so everyone the team just photographs their receipts and sends them in and so yeah you can get things that just do most stuff for you now which makes it a lot easier yeah and often banks these days will have some sort of bundle offer for example if you decide to do business banking with them they might actually be like we just give you free accountancy software or um here are some of the things that we do for you to make it easier so it depends on who you go with but you know there are options yeah that's the thing i always assume that it's all because all the language is quite opaque and confusing to me i'm like are you trying to get me to do something illegal like i don't know if i've got this is this a trick question but it's not it never is no one wants you to do anything illegal (laughs) And usually if you call the HMRC, you know, helpline crying, not that I've done this, I haven't had to do this, I promise. I'm not just saying that. I I have. I have. They are really nice on the phone, aren't they? I mean... No, they are super nice. Yeah, actually, they are very chill. I'd like to go back to social media. Well, no. What I'd like to go back to is advertising and getting your name out there. Because we talked a little bit about social media when Lorraine was mentioning the sort of training courses and like advice of how to do things like setting up an Instagram account and stuff. But we haven't gone from the start of how do you advertise? Is it all on social media? Is it all the modern way? Or do people have business cards these days? Do we have flyers? Do we have websites? What does the website look like? Are you on conservation register? I was going to start by saying I found it interesting to market what I do, mostly because people don't know what a conservator is. Um. Yeah, the (laughs) PR problem that you've mentioned before. I have a broad skill set, which is sometimes problematic because uh, I do a bit of everything isn't as striking a selling point as I only do. Oh, what is the most niche thing I can think of? I only do Victorian lace made in 1895. (laughs) Um I'm not niche. I do a bit of everything. There are certainly things that I prefer doing, but I I do a bit of everything. That can be a surprisingly difficult pitch. 
I can help you with almost anything is sounds great in theory, but it's difficult to <laughs> find in a search engine. It's it's very difficult to pinpoint like that. Oddly, it means that I think I do my better advertising in person if I talk to people and we can sort of drill down to what I do and I can throw in enough interesting examples, then actually that is much more helpful than people, say, finding my website or finding me on Instagram, actually. Uh, so it ends up being word of mouth. But I do have business cards, I do have social media accounts, and I do my best trying to get out there. But it is an interesting dilemma. Partly because you're charming as f- as well. Like, uh, people wow, meet you and they're like, oh, she was nice. <laughs> I don't know, I'm a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> anyway, what do you guys do? I mean, uh, is it websites? Is it uh, social media? Is it people just know who you are because you've been in the business for a little while? What, what happens? Well, I was going to say it's like you, Jenny. It's word of mouth. It's um, it's mm. it's using my network and people with, who I've known who I've done work for before, telling other people that I'm around and available. So it's it is still the really old fashioned yeah. way of word of mouth. And yes, I have a website. Yes, I have Instagram. Yes, I have Twitter, and I think they do help. But I feel that the way that they help is that people hear about me, then they go and look to see whether I'm a real person who can really do what I'm saying I do on my Twitter, my Instagram or my website, and then they contact me. But the main way is is word of mouth still. Yeah. How about you, Claire? I would agree. I think a lot of our work comes from word of mouth. And I think, again, sort of useful advice I think I was given right at the beginning of setting up the company was that it will take a while. To, you know, your company isn't fully grown straight away. It takes a while to build momentum and get the ball rolling. So I definitely agree with that, that it took a few years to sort of really get established a bit more. Um, but we get a lot of work through word of mouth, which is always really nice. We have invested in the website. So I think that's kind of, you know, someone said to me, it's like your shop window. You know, it's where people do go and check. I've heard of you or someone's recommended you. I'm just going to check that you are a company. Yeah. Do you, We have advertised in magazines. That sounds more glamorous. We are on the conservation register um, and we've done trade shows, which is um, mm. which is a really long day. So we have invested a bit in marketing, but it's difficult because it's expensive to do. It's very expensive. If you go for the sort of official routes. And we do have some, I think we've got a LinkedIn. I'm not massive on social media. I know that makes me sound like a bit of a old <laughs> fart, but um, we have got a LinkedIn account. Yeah, my children are really mortified that like, oh, your favorite social media is LinkedIn. That's so sad. Probably is a bit sad. But we do have an Instagram account. I don't manage it. Some of the team brilliantly does that who understands it a lot better than me. So, yeah, there's always, it's always something I feel we should be doing more of. But it's, yeah, it's, um yeah, and I signed up for Google Analytics and haven't actually used it yet. So <laughs> I've got intentions. It's just time. It's just finding time to do all the things as a business owner that you should be doing and actually working. Yeah, there's always things I think you could be you could be doing more of or thinking about, but you know sometimes you have to sleep and mm. see your family and <laughs> have a life. So, well, you you got to find a balance. That's the thing. Like you could be on all the social media channels, but like if it doesn't actually bring you business, then why would you? You know, mm. I like sharing what I do on social media, so that th- that works for me. But you know, if if you're not that kind of person and that's not how you get your work, then maybe don't. <laughs> that's fine. I was going to say, we shouldn't forget about the other ways that we can get our name out there. So, mm. for example, mm. writing blogs and writing blogs for other people and giving talks and presentations. And there's loads of other ways of doing it, which is is, is almost similar to, to putting an article in a trade magazine or um, paying for somebody to do marketing. But you're doing it yourself. And then that blog you can take and use for something else. So there are lots of other ways of doing it. It doesn't have to be the website. It doesn't have to be Twitter. It doesn't have to be all of that sort of thing. There's lots of inventive things that you can do. And I, f- I find the blogs and the talks and the presentations have been a really good way of generating more yeah. work and getting my name out there. <laughs> LinkedIn, I have to say, LinkedIn, I was never very keen on. I never really understood the point of LinkedIn until fairly mm. recently because, again, that's changed and that's got much better. And somebody approached me through LinkedIn because of a blog that I'd written for somebody else. They approached me through LinkedIn and I've got a very good job with them. Mm, we've actually been talking quite a lot recently about um, basically puzzling out how people learn about us. Because obviously we've got the, the the museum as the, the the face of us, I suppose. But we have a very good reputation for the conservation of banners. 
but we're just trying to work out how people find us. So a lot of people, it is through a Google search of, you know, textiles conservators in Manchester. And sometimes it's because they've been to the museum and they've seen us through the window or they've had a chat over coffee with someone who went on a tour with us or something in the studio. So it, for us, it's probably a combination of, well, online and word of mouth. But we've been thinking about doing things like, you know, when you get loads of you know, people saying, oh, can I have a quote for this? Can I have an estimate for this? And you give an estimate and you don't hear back or you hear back, but they say, oh, I'm going to need to get funding for that. Thanks very much. I'll get back to you. We've been thinking, oh, could potentially we send Christmas cards to those people and say, thanks very much for, you know, we're still here sort of thing. Here, have a card. Elbow, elbow. Are you here? Customer relations, sort of. Uh... Yeah, it is customer relations, but it's not something that we've really, there's not really been... There's not really been a gap, so we've we've always had a sort of steady flow of people turning up or calling up or emailing in saying, "I've got this. Can I talk to you about this?" And then that becomes work. It's it's a new way of thinking to seek it ourselves, if you see what I mean. But Chloe, you've just made me think of something that's um, I think very important for people who mm. are either starting on this journey or a little bit into this journey in that mm. you'll provide an estimate for somebody they'll come back to you a year later or in one case I had sort of like three years later and said is that estimate still valid well no because prices for everything have gone up mm. so I always now put on my estimates having learned the hard way this estimate is only valid for x period of time and it's 30 days in my case I do that yeah <laughs> Ah, that's really interesting. That's not something that we do, actually. And some people get back to us, you know, like five years afterwards or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. How does the valid for 30 days thing work with, for example, oh, what are they called now? NHLF? National Heritage Lottery Fund. National Heritage Lottery Fund. Yeah, I get so confused. So I'm just going to call them HLF and I'm really sorry. I'm just I get around that by not having had to quote for anything that was okay. involved in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get quite a lot of, um, a lot of the time we quote and they say, we know we will be seeking funding for this and we're going to use your quote as part of that funding. So essentially, I don't know if HLF require a conservation quote, but often with funding bodies, it's, it's more punchy in a way if you that turn in a quote saying, we have already talked to conservators so if you're saying this is part of my you know funding proposal my funding bid thank you very much that's you know seven thousand pounds in conservation and then the fund the seeking funding process lasts three months for example where does where does that so you just say the quote's valid for 90 days or 120 days okay or you could go you know if it takes more than six months to get the funding mm. it's plus 20 <laughs> percent yeah, <laughs> add, yeah yeah add that into your uh, yeah okay yeah funny that's bit, a good solution know? isn't it i have yeah. to say about an hour ago you said what was the worst thing about going into business and i completely forgot to answer that but this has reminded me it's quotes tenders and talking about money <laughs> <laughs> yeah apologies <laughs> 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 so, I was thinking there's lots of other things, but that's just come to mind that sometimes ugh, tendering is just, yeah, a bit of a bugbear because mm -hmm. there's, there's endless courses on how to tender. And I think I have seen some courses actually on how to write briefs for tenders because they can be a bit of a mixed bag of <laughs> trying to tender for something. I'm really rubbish at talking, at thinking about financial value. And I think this does probably come from a very privileged point of view that, you know, I'm employed. I don't. I don't have to worry about money coming in. I'm very lucky to be in a stable job. So it's sort of not really on my radar. This this sort of how do I get more money? And so in this, this sort of process of thinking about you know how to sort of what the the benefits of different work would be, I keep coming up with you know social and cultural benefits of like oh but we could really teach people and we could outreach and that is of course a benefit. But yeah, if you're paying bills. And, you know, making sure the tax pot is high enough and your, your pension is in place. Cultural value is not going to, you know, doesn't pay the rent. I mean, it is a money game. Uh, it is. It has numbers attached. I realise we're working for money, like, with, you know. <laughs> this is yeah. A Unfortunately, this is a capitalist society. This is a capitalist society. <laughs> this is what, yeah. and quite a lot of clients, they just want to know that what you cost. They just phone up, what you cost. I'm thinking, oh... <laughs> Okay, I'll knock some off or I could do a discount. And I've had to learn to, to actually think, no, this is what we're worth. 
this is yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and if you don't want to pay that that's fine because at the beginning I was doing stuff and making a loss or just breaking mm. even and actually yeah it's a lot of work to not get anything so just standing by this is our day rate and yeah take it or leave it Mm. I would also say with with the charges is to remember that you need to review your rates every year because there are statistics that are coming out from um, places like Ipsy where people haven't changed their their charges for something like five or ten years and to review them every year in line with the rate of inflation and put them up every year and don't apologise for that. Oh, honestly, we're not that good at valuing ourselves. Like we're not good at saying I'm worth money, you know, at this point. I, I went to university for five years and I have 10 years experience on top. I'm worth something. <laughs> like, regardless of how you look at it, that is worth something. And, you know, yes, some people won't be able to pay that. That is also true. But equally, my time is not free. It's not available for free. It, that's, it can't be. So it's, we're maybe not very good at thinking about valuing ourselves and our experience and our skills. Mm. We are specialists. And I really enjoyed the museum freelance survey, which included conservators in their responses about sort yeah. of what sort of day rates or hourly rates uh, people had, because there's not a lot of data out there um, necessarily about what we charge. And it was super interesting to look at. And I'll link to the report in the show notes because it is interesting to look at just just to know what other people charge for their time, for example. And, you know, it won't give you the sort of Im- level of information that you can, uh, I don't know, undercut uh, as the belly dancer. We don't all do it. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> well, it but it can give you an indication of what other people are charging, uh, whether you agree with it or not. Yeah, it's it's mm. tricky. But we, I think, as a profession, we're quite quite rubbish at saying no. We do something cool. We do something valuable. Something that most people can't do, and we should be paid for it. This, Jenny, this is why, um, talking about what Jenny said earlier about um, not being good about talking about money, this is why I included the slide of Darth Vader as the opening slide on becoming a professional. Because the attitude that I get as somebody who set up their own business in conservation is that I have gone over to the dark side because I am working for money. And somehow that's made me lower my standards and be less of whatever I used to be. But at the end of the day, as you say, Chloe, everybody works for money. I think when I had my sort of change of thought, I read this book called, I think it's called Little Voice, Big Business. And it's all about standing up for yourself and knowing your value. And I was reading it on holiday, which which is probably about actually running a business that you read business books on holiday. And I had to reply, somebody emailed saying, can I just confirm your day rate? And I read this book and I thought, no, I'm going, you know, I replied back and said, actually, no, it's gone up by 50 pounds a day. Um, and it was quite a few days. And then I was <laughs> thinking, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? And they emailed back within about four seconds. We're like, yeah, fine. I thought, wow, there you go. It's that easy. <laughs> That's the thing. I feel like I find that if the, if someone knows that it's going to cost money, they will expect it to cost money. And if someone doesn't, ex- if someone is thinking, oh, it'll probably be a be, you know, you know, seventy five quid or something for a whole piece of conservation work, then it doesn't matter whether that is a grand or five grand depending on how you've you know valued your time and your materials and your expertise it's not part of their budget it wasn't what they were expecting maybe their understanding of what you're offering is different so I wondered if we could talk quickly about collaboration because I I was thinking about it earlier and then we were talking a bit about something else and Claire you mentioned having colleagues and members of your team and stuff and I think I'm interested to hear about the decision to expand with others the decision to collaborate with people who you might not sort of have under the same umbrella as uh, as the same company umbrella and what leads you to those decisions as well and I mean maybe we could talk about recruitment as a freelancer as well but I don't know if I don't know if if anyone wants to (laughs) (laughs) I love recruitment recruitment or tax I'd have taken recruitment (laughs) when I set the company up I mean, every day you're learning because it's a steep learning curve setting up a company. You know, you've, there's so much, like Lorraine was saying, you need to know that isn't just sort of conservation. So I didn't set up the company thinking, yep, I'm going to employ more conservators. But I think you know, something you find is that work comes in at the same time. So you'll have nothing for three weeks and then two people have to have you physically in a place in two different places and you can't 
be at both places at both times. So I'd started finding that I couldn't do work because I was already booked in for that period of time. And I think because we have to, because it's not like filming and you have to be at the historic property when the film crew are there, you can't say, can we rearrange it or do a different time? So I think I hate turning down work. And that's something I haven't learned yet is how you say no or you turn things down. Because I'm always worried that that client might never come back or you sort of lost them. But I, I, so I started to get work at the same time. So I thought it'd be nice to have somebody else. And I think it's sort of what I was used to at English Heritage. I'd worked with a team. I'd worked with loads of really great conservators. And I was used to being a team of conservators, you know, with people you could talk to or do projects together. And I think I really missed it. I missed working as a part of a team of conservators. So we uh, recruited and the company employs four conservators at the moment, including me. And we've got six conservators on contract. So I really like the team aspect and we do a lot of projects together but we can't we there's lots of things that we don't do so when we get asked to do um say a risk assessment for a museum there's might be a certain collection that we we aren't you know we don't know a lot about so we'd always call in experts in that field to work with them and and we have facilities managers all kinds of people that we will ask for help and to come in give us advice because we can't cover all of it and I really like those projects so we did some really nice stuff from museum that's having major refurbishment and we got people like um, Vicky Purewell in to talk about their natural history to come survey that for us um, we use Lux and Livre a lot who I think you've had on the show talking about storage of uh, free of things in freezers Sarah Glenn I'm just going to name check every conservative I've never met <laughs> it's like <laughs> stop the Oscars <laughs> but but I just like I suppose I'm an extrovert I just like working with other people so mm. I think that's I mean I don't know Lorraine Jenny how you find it I found it a bit lonely in the beginning when it was just me but is that just me it is definitely odd but I, I think it also helped maybe <sighs> helped that's a horrible thing to say so I sort of went from working closely in teams in in one employed place to being the only conservator mm. but being part of a museum setting. So I would have colleagues, but they weren't in the lab with me. Like they they were on hand. So there was an aspect of, you know, social life there, but they, they weren't people to directly maybe talk treatments with or that sort of thing. So it was like a, a gradual weaning of having people <laughs> around me. And then I left that job in a pandemic when I basically stopped seeing all of my colleagues. And it was like having no colleagues. <laughs> it was really weird, uh, other than via Zoom uh, or Teams or whatever we were using. And uh then going completely on being on my own. Uh, so it was almost like weaning myself <laughs> off social contact in some ways. So it's, it's, not, not, it's not been as traumatic as maybe I thought it would be, but it is, it's definitely different. I've been really lucky in that where I have my premises now, it's sort of part of a creative hub. Um, so I don't have other conservators around me, but there are other creative people in the building that I can go out and have a natter with if I need to, mm. which is a surprising bonus. Uh, there's also a dog who is lovely. Free dog. But it, it does mean that there are other people that I can sort of bounce ideas with, even if they have maybe no uh, intrinsic knowledge knowledge of what I'm actually talking about. At least they can have some sort of idea of, oh, I see you're trying to make something stick to something else, but you can't use any of these things. Okay, well, that, that sounds interesting. Uh, have you considered propping it up in this way or something? And it, even that little bit of banter is helpful. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm sort of on my own, but also sort of not, which is an interesting contrast. How about you, Lorraine? So the last two employed jobs I was in, I was conservator in the basement on my own. Oh, dear. So, you know, I, I I was not a particularly sociable life. And unlike Jenny, yes, I had colleagues and I could go to the pub on a Friday evening and have a drink. But if I wasn't in the studio working but chatting to a colleague, then I wasn't getting the work done. So I was I was on my own. And I found those those two jobs, particularly the first one of those two jobs, really quite um unsociable and lonely. Mm. And actually I would say now that my work is more sociable, even though I'm a sole trader. So like I think it was Jenny who said, oh, Claire, who said that, you know, you'll bring freelancers in, people who've got specialism. So if there's something that I can't do, I'll bring in another conservator who can do that or somebody who has those skills. But also with the clients, because I get out and see my clients, I've got a really good relationship with them. And I've been working with quite a few of them now for so long. And I actually saw one of them um, who I've worked with a lot for the first time since before the pandemic last Friday. And her son is now 16. The first time I met her son, he was a bump. Aww. And he's now 16 and doing his GCSEs. So it's really friendly in that way, and really <laughs> sociable in a way that my being employed never was for me. Mm. Clients, that could be another whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> 
there's definitely a lot of people management skills required um, when you're self-employed or running a business, you know, it's the people management skill side of it is you have to like people. You can't just be about your objects, unfortunately. <laughs> And it's all those skills that, um, I they call them soft skills. And I think that makes them sound really weak. Power skills, I think some of you call them. That, you know, reading the room, negotiation, influence, conflict resolution, just a lot of clients say what they want and you can tell that's not actually what they want. And it's just it's just constantly sort of interpreting mm. sort of all those other, yeah, messages that you're getting when you when you go somewhere. I'm not explaining that very well, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's people management, I guess. People skills are definitely uh, something that we all need. I'm definitely still, you know, making a complete arse out of myself every now and then, uh, because I'm still learning how to communicate with people and what not to do. And sometimes it's as easy as some types of people will mm. not get along with you. And that's also fine. That's then you're learning a valuable lesson, um, both about yourself and about some other people. And that's, that's fine. I thought we would just quickly end on what is your favorite thing about running a business? Because I thought that would be fun. My favorite thing is the freedom. I can do what I want when I want to do it with whoever I want to do it. And the example I always use is one day I had loads of work that needed to be done. And I just wasn't in the right space mentally to do it. So I went and borrowed Harry, the part-time studio hound, and we went for a lovely walk all day. Love it. That's great. <laughs> for me, it's a roller coaster. Never a dull moment. There's lows, but there's also real highs. And yeah, if, if you like problem solving and challenges, then running a business mm. is, is for you. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys, for sharing. It's been really nice talking about this with you. Um, thanks so much for joining yeah, us. thank you. Just a couple of quick things before I let you all go. We've talked about sole traders and limited companies today, but of course there are many other types of companies here in the UK, and I thought it was worth a quick mention. A couple of people in conservation run something called Community Interest Companies, which is a very different beast. And if you'd like to learn a bit more about what it's like starting one of those, I've linked to a blog post on the Natska blog about starting a social business written by Victoria Purwell. Do check that out. I also completely forgot to let Lorraine talk about a new book that's coming out in print format. So sorry, Lorraine. But we'll be reviewing that one in a future episode, so stay tuned. In the meantime, you can look up the low-cost, no-cost tips for sustainability and cultural heritage, how to reduce your impact on the planet, and order it from your bookshop of choice. If you're enjoying The C Word and would like to support our work, then please consider becoming one of our patrons. For as little as $1 per month, you can help us keep our episodes online and more of them coming. Patreon helps us meet our regular costs for the show, and also to plan ahead so we know roughly how much of a monthly budget we've got. That's super helpful when you're trying to do something special like buy a better microphone or save up to go to a special event. Your support also helps keep us free of advertisement. In return, our supporters get access to our archive of extended episodes, which you can only access on our Patreon page. Yeah, for that $1 a month, you get a little extra audio enjoyment. We've crunched the numbers, and it's about 10% extra content on a regular basis. That's not bad for less than a cup of coffee, eh? If supporting us sounds like something you'd like to do, then head over to patreon.com slash the C word and join our bunch of absolute champions. Thanks for listening. With the C-Word, and you've been listening to Claire Fry, Lorraine Finch, Chloe Rumsey, and me, Jenny Mathiason. Join us next time for an episode more hopefully about metals. Um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> In the meantime, you can check out our website at theseaword.show, tweet us at the C-Word Podcast, or simply email us on theseawordpodcast at gmail.com. Our intro and outro music is Spring Buddy the Mystic, used under Creative Commons Attribution License. Additional music and sound effects by Callum Robertson. This has been a Wooden Dice production. Above above my desk, I've got smooth seas do not make skillful sailors. Oh my god! So Ooh. every time there's a bit of a bad time, or you know, it's you learn from it. Mm. <laughs> it's a uh, it's an interesting experience. In, in which case, I, I should add mine <laughs> that I have uh, up on my no notice board at, uh, at work as well, which is um, uh, do what you love and what makes you happy. Otherwise, what is the f point? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.